Ladies, you want to help me celebrate them? Come on, celebrate Femi Flames at the elevation place of praise. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 28, the scripture says, For we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And he said, all things. All things there means all things. Doesn't mean all good things, but all things. And sometimes it's difficult for you to understand how a bad thing is going to work together for the good of the person that is going through it. As we preach and teach the word of God today, I believe that God has set somebody up here for a time of divine recalibration. God wants to recalibrate your mind and recalibrate your perspective. I want to impact on you the spirit of faith. You know, the spirit of faith, when it's at work in the life of a believer, it makes your confession consistent and constant. You just realize that you want to break down, but you are not able to. You want to say something differently, but you are not able to. It's the oppression of the spirit of faith in the life of a believer. Because it's so, you're so mindful of the fact that all things are supposed to be working together for my good. So when I face adversity, it's so ingrained in my mind that this one too, shall come to pass. This one too is working together for my good. So the spirit of faith comes alive in you and jacks you up to the realm of God. Not to reality. Reality is the lowest realm. Scripture says, why we look not at the things which are seen. For the things which are uh, seen are temporal. Temporal means subject to change. Can I say it one more time? Reality is the lowest realm. Yeah. The highest realm is the realm of God where all things are subject to change. <laughs> where things can turn around just by a proclamation. Reality is the lowest realm of existence. Facts are inferior to truth. Because fact only speaks to what is happening. Truth speaks to what is written. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Facts can change. Truth is unchangeable. And facts will work to corroborate the truth. It's just a matter of time. I will say together. So there's a place I can get to in the operations of the word of God in my life that consistently activates the spirit of faith to the end that I don't see any other thing apart from the truth. I don't say any other thing apart from the truth. Even when I feel like saying what is happening, uh, the spirit of faith moves me to say what is written. <laughs> if somebody say here today, when you work with such people or anyone operating on that the operation of the spirit of faith, sometimes their life can be a bit confusing. Sometimes you even feel like they are losing, they are losing it. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how do you think people would have thought about Abraham when he was alive? Yeah. Something, I mean, his neighbors would have con con concluded that he's not well. Something is wrong with him. Yeah. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. Abraham just woke up one day and said, we're moving. He said, where to? I don't know. He said, uh, this lack of children is beginning to affect him. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the conclusion. They say, ah, if only God would just give this guy a child. Because this lack of children is affecting him. Because how can a grown man just pick his wife and his nephew and say they are going? And he said, where are you going? He said, God said he will, he will show me. <laughs> I pray for somebody today that the spirit of faith will indwell you. Yes. That your doubt will be eradicated. Yes. That God will launch you to a realm of trust that is beyond the fact that you can see. Yes. 
Oh, somebody say better amen today. Yeah. And today I'm speaking to something that is, you know, very important and very, uh, that, that I believe that God will use to turn somebody's mind around because uh, our, lives move, moves, uh, our lives move forward based on the change that we go through in our mind. A perspective shifting discussion today. We love to do this from time to time as we build resilient faith in us. And don't forget, we're still in that series of teachings that we've tagged resilient faith. Now, speaking to the subject uh, that I've titled, Don't Waste Your Pain. Those of us who have been here for long, you probably will have heard this message before, but not in this format. I even have a book with that title, Don't Waste Your Pain. I wrote this book, I think, eight years ago now. But over the years, I've seen things unfold in other dimensions that have added some more understanding. But the truth shared in this book and the first message I preached on this subject are still as valid, you know, like they were then and forever. Uh, as, I, as I speak this morning, I'll refer to uh, one or two stories from this book because this book has a lot of stories and descriptions about how pain seeks to destroy the spirit of faith. See, when the devil throws something at a believer, his target is not, if it's about your health, his target is not your body. His target is your faith, your capacity to trust God. When the devil throws something at your business, the target is not just to destroy the business, but to destroy your faith. Because it's not, in, it's not enough to destroy the business. If your faith is intact, you will rebuild it ten times over. Yeah. So the devil is not just after, it's not just after your child. It's after your faith. Because if your faith is intact, you can turn things around again and again. So the real target is your faith. Your capacity to trust God in the midst of trouble. That's what the devil is after when he throws different jabs at us. And can I say this, that there's a time where if there's a time to develop resilient faith in God as a believer, this is the time. Because the things happening in our world will start to ramp up seriously. Yeah. This is a time where we'll be separating boys from men in the spirit. Yeah. Many more things will still happen. But our faith is what will hold us strong. Our faith is what will hold us strong. Can you hear me tell your neighbor, say, don't waste your pain. Don't waste your pain. Say to somebody else, say, don't waste your pain. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Please pay attention to the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Everyone online, pay attention to the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 4, I read from verse 7 down to 10. New King James Version. Second Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 7 down to 10. I've titled this, don't waste your pain. Don't waste your pain. As we prepare for the Accelerated Conference starting this Wednesday, we want to trust God to take our faith to a level where it can no longer be dis di disturbed, no longer be limited by what we're going through. So that as the word will come to us this week in different dimensions, our heart will be open to receive it. Glory be to Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessel, that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. We are at pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Paul the apostle writing here in this letter to the church at Corinth. Describing what he had gone through in certain definite terms and definite words. That you cannot mistake. 
Anyone who wrote this has had definite life experiences that is beyond just being poetic. You know, when you have gone through some things, even if you are not poetic, your poetry gift starts to come out. Yeah. One of the most philosophical people on earth are people who have suffered hardship. The Psalms of David were Psalms written out of agony, despair, discouragement. And those are some of the Psalms that are holding us up today all over the world. What are you writing from your own experiences? What has your experience engendered in you? Has it engendered bitterness? Are you now a sorrowful person, bitter person, uneasy to console because of what you have gone through? Look at your neighbor for me again. Say, don't waste your pain. Yeah. Adversity, it can bring negativity out of someone. At the same time, adversity can bring the most encouraging piece of writing or poetry or song out of another person. In Don't Waste Your Pain, the book I wrote about the guy that wrote the hymn, It Is Well, one of the most popular him in Christianity today. It is well, it is well, wait my soul, wait my soul. It is well, it is well, wait my soul. I researched him when I was writing this book and I wrote a bit about him. In the Chicago fire, I think of 1847 or 1807, I can't remember. The guy lost everything that he had ever labored for. If you get him, Google Chicago, Chicago fire. You'll see what happened there. It was unprecedented, a destructive fire that destroyed the economy of the city, destroyed what people have built over the years. And those were still primitive days in America uh, where today you can suffer that kind of fire and get insurance and bounce back and all that. And the guy happened to be a Christian. Uh, it was in the pain of what he was going through that he wrote the hymn. That hymn, we still sing it almost every week at funerals, at different things today. Uh, and when we sing it, uh, people regain hope, the consciousness of hope and the workings of the spirit. Whatever you're going through today, I just want you to know that the Bible says that God is working everything out for your good. People have discovered their callings, their ministry, outstanding business ideas, are pivotal relationships while dealing with negative situations. So negative situation is not always bad. In fact, they're supposed to open us up for a move of God that we've never experienced before. How do I know the multi-dimension, the multi-faceted God, multi-dimensional God, if uh, I'm only subject to one area of him or one knowledge of him because I've allowed what I'm going through to shut down my mind from exploring the God. Somebody know, some people know, uh, know God uh, for, for provision as the God who provides. Somebody has experienced God before as a healer. Somebody has experienced God before as, 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 as a, a rock that you can run to. Some people have experienced God before as the one who bring the solitaries into family and connects people. All kinds of experience, but if you have not been in want, if you have not been at a place where things, the experience demands that you explore a different side of God, you may never be able to explore that side of God. And when Paul was describing this in, in 2 Corinthians 4 here, said we have this treasure in earthen vessel. And was talking about the fact that as humans, we're made out of sand, out of clay. You know, it would have been easier if we're made maybe of metallic product or metallic materials. Some of us will not be crumbling like this. Yeah. If you meditate on that, I mean, maybe at Accelerate, I'll share a bit more about that. The fact that God was very deliberate about what he created, how he created us and what he created us with. You know, in engineering, there are different terminologies that we use. I, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. If 
even when it comes to, I mean, materials. I studied science of materials, strength of materials. There are different kinds of materials. And when materials go through different kind of situations like heat, like pressure, it turns it into some, is it that it hardens it, make it more malleable, make it stronger, you can bend it more, all right? Uh, uh, even when it comes to sand, we have load-bearing sand and sand that cannot bear load. That's why when you want to, um, how do I put it, sand fill a place that will still take maybe a building, there's some kind of sand you can't use there. If not, when you finish the building, the building will still go down. Yeah. This kind of sand you use there is what we call load-bearing sand. That when you put pressure on it, it does not crumble. Many people are praying for heavy destinies. Yet, you are not trusting God for the structure that will carry it. Lord, bless me. Bless me with my husband. Bless me with my wife. Bless me with children. But marriage comes with its own pressure. What are you doing to secure the strength, your backbone for marriage as a single person, for instance? Don't just pray about a beautiful home. What about the strength that is based on the revelation of the God who is giving you the home? So that when the pressure of marriage comes, when the pressure of raising children comes, you will not be an emotional wreck. Because some people actually think that beautiful things in life don't come with their attendant pressures. So you focus on the beautiful stuff, you're not focusing on how you're going to gain strength. You know, while many CEOs are on drugs, whether drug as in medication or drug as in the other drug, you understand what I'm saying? We all join. It's all. Uh, they, they, they. Many people at, that, at certain levels, they do everything. Whatever it will take to keep sanity. Yeah. That is to, or to. Yeah. Whatever it will take just to, to be able to hold four meetings in a day and still be okay. But there's a power of the Holy Spirit that indwells the believer. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you are filled with the Spirit, the strength of the Most High overshadows you. Are you still with me today? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. As a believer, you need to know how to dive deep into the things of the Spirit so that when God starts to promote you, you won't crumble under pressure. How do you keep running? And not fainting, according to Isaiah chapter 40, uh, I think verse 16, 17, or thereabouts, he said, uh, uh, though the, the, the young men may run and, you know, and, and, and lose strength and all that, but said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Can you look for that scripture, somebody? Is there a Bible scholar on the system today? Yeah, uh, look for it. Yeah, and please stop putting novices on the system. Yeah, we need people who know Bible to sit on that system. Not computer, Bible, Bible. Yeah. All right? Yeah, go to Isaiah 40 and look for the scripture for me. Yeah, quickly, quickly. I'm still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't find it, I'll ask for your name. After now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Said those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. Can you, can you, uh, um, can you go, go to the earlier part? Verse, go to verse, um, yeah. Verse 30 says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. The youth may faint and be weary, the young man, men may utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who wait on the Lord. You see, those who wait on the Lord, there means many things. It can mean that we spend time in his presence so that he infuses us with his spirit. It also means to yield yourself to the Lord. Yeah. Like the porter is yielded, I mean, the, the clay is yielded to the porter. Yeah. That's, that's what it also means. Many people run out of the hands of God while he's still trying to perfect them. And you say the pain is too much. The pain is too much. The pain is too much. Can you, can you put that short clip of the, 
the, the, yeah. Look at, look at this, this potter and the clay. See the pressure that is putting on it. Somebody, the small relationship issue you're having now is that small pressure. And you didn't sleep overnight crying, crying. You better brace up because more is coming. Yeah, because there's, there's a person that God is trying to make out of you. I know maybe this is not what you want to hear today. I'm still going to pray for you, don't worry. Yeah, but let's, let's follow what discuss this one. Yeah, when all the pressure, you, you see, this clay now will be saying, what are you doing to me? You are pressing me. You are pressing me too much. Pressing me too much. Ah! Yeah. You see, very soon now, the potter will now put the hand inside it. It's like God putting his hand inside your eyes. It's feeling pain. But there's a shape that is trying to achieve. And for somebody, until that shape starts to come out, it's not going to stop. If it stops, your shape will be distorted. Are you seeing that? Yeah. The shape will be distorted. So that pressure, everything, is what makes this beautiful shape. And this good stuff that you can use either as a flower vase, as whatever you want to use, as just decorative piece, you know. It's not easy to put all these flowery thing shapes on, on a pot like this. This was clay, sand, before now. And they molded it together. Yeah, molded it together. And God keeps it. And this is not metal. So if I drop it, it's going to fall. That's what Paul was saying. If it falls, it's going to break. If I drop it now, it's going to shatter here. And Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessel. What should that say to us? That we need to carry ourselves as the one that's ready to be molded. Yeah. They that wait upon the Lord, they that stay subjected to God. They that won't run out of his hands. We have many people now, post-COVID, who have run away from church under one pretense or the other. And the devil has a lease on some of them right now. Yeah, short-term lease. Come back, come back to church. The lease is over in Jesus' name. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, some of such people are watching online. It's not everybody online, though. Yeah, I understand that some people have to be online. And it's not just about showing up physically in church. That's not what I'm talking about. Some people have lost their prayer experience, prayer life. Yeah. They've lost the move of the Spirit in their lives. They no longer hear from God. From being, living, you know, a supernatural life, we are now living purely natural. Yeah. And still, you need to brace up. That's part of what we hope to achieve with the Accelerate Conference this week. To jack some people up back to their feet. And to bring them back into the full realization of what God is trying to do in their lives. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. So negative situations may be a result of bad decisions or a life challenge, but whatever the negative situation that you may be going through, please understand that God wants to use it to shape you and put you back into shape. Yeah. And, and, and create something out of your life that will be beautiful. That will be beautiful. That will be beautiful. One of the challenges I want to speak to you today quickly as I move on deeper into this message is that when God starts to uh, work on us or allow certain things to come into our lives that like ordinarily should shape us, many of us have gotten used to certain auto responses or default setting that will not make us realize or actualize what God wants to do. You know, this past week I sent a friend in the U.S. an email. Apparently I didn't know that he had started his holiday. And I got a, a, a response. When I got a response within like uh, 30 seconds or something, oh, I was like, wow, <laughs> this guy is so sharp in his response. I was happy. I thought I had gotten my response quickly. So I opened the email and I realized I was an auto-response. To say hi, I... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm on holiday for the next two and a half weeks, and if you want this done, get in touch with uh, this person. Get in touch with Jacqueline if you want this done. And you know all those kind of emails. Sometimes it's a phone call. 
you know, that you just get autoresponder saying this. Some of us, when issues come into our lives, the autoresponse sets in. And it's not allowing what God wants to do to be done. We block the influence of the Holy Spirit. We limit the influence of God over us and the situation as we go into our auto-response. Can we deal with a few auto-responses? Quickly. And then I will take us through how to come out of, how to turn your pain to power and we'll end this message. Can you let me ask your neighbor, what is your auto-response? Some people's auto-response. Let's, let's deal with examples of auto-responses in crisis. In crisis, some people's auto-response is fear. It's fear. The only thing is that fear paralyzes initiative. The moment you allow fear to be your auto-response, the next thing is that you are scattered. You don't know what to do. And fear just starts to build up. Can I encourage somebody today, rather than allowing fear as your auto-response, when fear knocks the door, let faith opens it, open it. When faith opens the door, when fear knocks the door, fear cannot withstand your faith. Are you still with me today? Fear cannot withstand your faith. When fear knocks the door in crisis, let faith be the one to respond to that fear. Let absolute trust in God. Uh, let your con con confession be constant and consistent. How does fear open the door when you wake up in the morning and you feel like you can't move your leg and declare in the name of Jesus, Jesus, uh, carry my, 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 my pain and my sicknesses on the cross. And God is able to make me stand according to the word of God. So I, I, I attempt to stand even though I know that the pain is there. But when fear knocks at the door, you wake up in the morning and you can't move your leg and say, we're, we're done. I'm dead. So this is how I'm going to end up on a wheelchair. Yeah. The moment you start to say that, the pain multiplies, actually. The devil comes in full force. He said, this place is conducive. Atmosphere, conducive. You know the way, uh -huh, you, it's like you're typing something. I say, yeah, everything, okay. Moving. Envoy, it's time to move in. Move in more. Yeah, multiply headache. Multiply, you know, this one. That's what happens. But when fear knocks on the door, let faith be the one to answer. And faith responds with the word of God. Now I was saying the other time that uh, some people are going through small, small demonic oppressions. And because of that, God is no longer faithful. They don't come to church again and all. What do you do to Jesus? The devil himself showed up. <laughs> the, the Bible says the devil came to tempt him. He didn't send a demon. He came. You, you have never seen the devil before. Real devil. Yeah. At most, maybe some spiritual wickedness or principality. But the devil came. And if Jesus could defeat the devil by saying it is written, then no demon can withstand it is written. Yeah. Are you still with me today? Very important. Very important. Passive posture. It's another uh, uh, auto-response that some people give. Whenever there's crisis, some people in their marriage, nothing is addressed. It's always passive posture. Passive posture. Being passive is not the same as being patient. Passive people helplessly watch problems grow bigger. Just helplessly watch problems go, grow bigger. That's what passivity does. It doesn't change anything. Come out of that passive outlook. There are issues to be addressed. You need to face it. Don't let your auto response be, you know, just being passive. Passive posture. Some people, you know, you run your spouse crazy by just being passive. The person is wondering, are we not going to do anything? You don't see anything. And nothing is changing. Things are getting, you know, you know, it's one thing for crisis to come and I see your effort in faith. I see what you are doing. If I'm your partner, I feel safer around you. But you're not doing anything. You're the moment, see, a closed mouth is a closed destiny. The moment you refuse to speak in the face of affliction, other things will start to gang up against you. 
Because that's how some people move from, you know, just being passive to then mild depression. Before you know it, the, the devil comes upon their emotion. They say, this is full-blown clinical depression. Because when you're supposed to be speaking, when it was still a small demon, you didn't speak. You didn't say anything. Then it starts to multiply. Then bigger ones start to come. The righteousness which is of faith speaks. It speaks. It speaks. Resilient faith speaks faith and trust in God all the time. The prophet has the woman who just lost her son. Woman, is it well? Said it is well. 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 But this boy has to wake up. Or it is well. And she received her son back to life. Because she believes it is well. Yeah. Glory be to Jesus. We're talking resilient faith here. Resilient faith cannot be cultivated with auto response. It's time for you to allow the Holy Spirit to invade your privacy. To deal with your auto responses to critical issues of life. And turn them from auto response to scriptural response. Because the life of a believer is supposed to believe by faith. And living by faith means that you are living in line with the word of God. The just shall live by faith. Faith is not auto-response. It's not case sera sera. What will be will be. You know, as, as smooth as that sounds, it doesn't lead you anywhere. Case sera sera. Yeah. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. You, and you know the song now. I'm not going to sing it here this morning. Yeah. And that's what some people will just be playing. When things are, uh, they'll be playing it. And what? Whatever will be, will be. For where? In my house? No. 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 You know, I've said, I don't know how many times I've said this in this church. That case sera sera is not fit. Yeah. We are not here for whatever will be, will be. We make things happen. We don't watch things happen. Yeah. We make things happen. By faith, the word was made. Yeah. We make things. We create things. We don't watch things happen. You can create a bliss in your home by faith. You can build a business from scratch. You can rebuild a business that's crashing. You don't watch it crash and say what will be, will be. No. We build it back to life by faith in God, who is the builder of all things. I can't be joined to the God of the living, the builder of all things, and what things crumble around my life. No, 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 no. Some people's auto-response is blaming others. Some people are even experts in blaming the dead. You know, like somebody like me now, my parents are no longer alive. What does he help? And who does he help? If, and I start blaming my parents, uh, some people say, eh, if only my father had paid my school fees on time and I enter secondary school the, the, uh, two years earlier, according to my age, this person will not be my boss now. I see the way he's speaking to me. So what are you going to do about that? It's your boss. You didn't go to school on time. Stop blaming the dead. Focus on what is happening. Because there are ways that you can package your life by faith that your career cannot be stagnant. And when you go through certain things, you know like Paul said, this is our life affliction, which is just but for a moment. It's not forever. And it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So, becoming bitter with God is another thing that people do. Auto response. The moment something not too good happens, you're just driving on the road. And somebody drives into you, or you lost a tire. But we pray this morning now. We even had money devotion. And we've not been having it till today. After two weeks, we had money. Why is it that? Is it the day that we had money devotion? That one is now losing tire on the bridge. What kind of thing is this? And, and they say God answers prayer. And uh, you know? How can that change things, really? Make sure that your negative auto responses are being worked on this season. Because some of those things are destroying faith and the expression of your trust in God. Stop blaming people. Stop blaming God. Yeah. Stop blaming God. Stop this passive posture. And lastly, 
procrastinating. You know, giving it time. Some people have been able to access what to do. But it's just that we're wasting time on what to do. And before you know it, it starts to, your face starts to dwindle. Yeah, your face starts to dwindle. Because you know what to do, but you're refusing to do it. The Holy Spirit wants to help you challenge those negative auto-responses by faith. By faith. By faith. That's why 2 Corinthians 3, when you read verse 17 and 18, it says, why we behold faintly as in a glass. It said, we, we, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of God. Verse 18 said, we are changed from one level of glory to another by the Spirit of God. That change happens when we refuse to embrace the negative auto-response. And we open it up to the Holy Spirit. So build resilient faith by developing the ability to navigate and come out of loss, negative change, and you know, traumatic experiences through the help of the Holy Spirit. In, in, in the book, Don't Waste Your Pain, I wrote about all kinds, I mean, different kinds of experiences and different kinds of pain and trials, familiar trials, talking from what happens in families. Joseph had familiar trials within family, ganging up against him, and God seeing him through that voyage of pain that lasted many years. Moses, familiar trials. The people who took him in, who were supposed to bring him up to, I mean, that's where the, the, the trials started from. And all kinds of things, working against the call of God upon his life. Vocational trials. Some people's worst experiences will be on their career path. Some people will have it cool at home. The devil waits for you at work. Yeah. And, the de and, and God, God deliberately allows some of those things just to allow, like we said before, just to shape you. And it does not mean that God is not faithful. But he wants to develop resilient faith in you. Yeah. He wants to develop resilient faith in you. And there are many stories. Stories. Let me just speak one of the stories here and I'll wrap up with way, way, four ways to turn your pain to power. One of the stories here. And uh, this, the, when I wrote this book eight years ago, the story was even still building up. The story of uh, Erica Fremantle, this uh, black British lady uh, who's been coming around here in Nigeria a bit. I understand she's, she's a believer. She's gone through some of the most traumatic experiences that anyone can imagine in life. And I have a few stories from, you know, people within and even... Uh, in the U.S., a few people I've met before in conferences. I mean, I, I, met, I met a guy, I wrote a story in this book, who was born blind, uh, lame, you know, with some of his limbs. He could hardly move. And his father insisted that this guy must go to school up to university level. Yeah. His father took a night job to be able to be with him in class on a daily basis. Because they said they will only take him in school if there will be an adult, an adult beside him helping him with certain things. As at the time I met uh, that family in the U.S., I think in maybe 20, 2009 or something, this guy was already graduating from the University of Louisiana. And I was at a conference where they brought him to demonstrate his life from the beginning and what his life was right now. And his father was there to give a testimony. And his father had now become a coach, coaching parents with Kids who have, you know, kids that they could have abandoned. The guy became very, you know, an expert in music. He was leading the school band, University of Louisiana at that time. He was blind. Yeah, he could play multiple instruments. With his twisted fingers, he had been playing the keyboard since he was three or four. Many people have such kids today and they lock up them up somewhere. Because they cannot even understand. Why would a good God send me a deformed child? But it's not about you. It's about your resilient faith in God. And the statement that God wants to make through that situation. 
Erica, in her own story, you know, was abused from age four to six or so by her uncle sexually from age four. Yeah. She was bullied in school in the UK from about age eight to 16. They spat on her, did all kinds of things. Then she now had this terrible car crash. She was at a gas station and a car, I think, ran into her. That was when she lost her hair, lost everything. They almost amputated her leg. She had hip replacement, a back, repla all kinds of replacement. Yeah. But today, she's a big name in fashion. She had, they said she had like two, 200 scars on her face. But today, she's everywhere. Uh, this year or so, I think she's been in, in this country like two or three times this year at different events where they just carry her everywhere. She's top name now. But if you look at her life, you can read up about her online. And she's granted so many interviews as well. You would think this kind of person, her life has finished. Yeah, because of all the trials and the travail that she has gone through. Some people only had one surgery. And any time you talk about God can heal, they don't believe again. Say, why didn't he heal me? Why do I have to go through surgery? During COVID, a brother called me and said, PG, I had, I had COVID. I said, hey, oh, sorry about that. I said, but, but we took communion now. Why do I have COVID? I said, you have COVID, you are still calling me. Maybe it's the communion that saved your life. Sometimes communion is not to prevent COVID, but to heal you in COVID. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so people come up with all kinds of things when they're going through. <laughs> and instead of looking at what God may want to do through it, Jesus was uh, uh, to, to, to heal someone and he said, this sickness is not unto death, but that the, that, that the name of God may be glorified by it. Glory be to Jesus. I want to encourage you to get, get a copy of this small book you know, for somebody that needs to read it this season. During, during COVID, a prominent lady lost her husband and I was tagged on a, on a social media page. And she put this there, that she, she read this. A widow with a uh, 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 few children and her husband very prominent in the past. And that this gave her a lifeline, knowing that she, she can bounce back emotionally because of the kind of you know, stories and encouragement there. Glory be to Jesus. I said, glory be to Jesus. James 1, verse 2, as I start to wrap up. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God said, I'm still working on you. Count it all joy. Don't let it destroy your faith. Don't let it make you feel like God is not faithful when you fall into all kinds of situations. Say, but let patience have its perfect work. Knowing, verse, verse 3 says, knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have the perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Yeah, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 10. He said, if you fail in the day of adversity, he said, your strength is small. Message translation says, if you fall to pieces, in crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. <laughs> There's more to me. So I'm not going to fall down and break into pieces in crisis. Paul said, we are struck down but not destroyed. The purpose of the crisis is not to destroy me, it's to test the metal of my strength. So that when it shows, or if it shows that I lack strength, God can give me more strength. I was talking to a woman once. And she said, Pastor, the greatest spiritual school of my life is this boy, pointing to his first son, her first son, this boy. He said, I didn't know how to pray before. But when this boy started his wala, my prayer life grew. <laughs> so he said, this, the greatest agent of spiritual growth in my life is that boy. Said at one point, this boy was the most confused human being on earth. The most confused human being I've ever seen. 
He said, I prayed that confession out of his life. There's no better person, for instance, to, to, to then talk to somebody who's dealing with a confused child than that kind of a woman. That's how we don't waste our pay. Because God wants to use what you have been through to tell other people that he's still alive and well and working wonders. Are you still with me today? Let me wrap it up. Four ways to turn your, your pain to power. One, if the situation that you are in was brought in because of bad decision or a bad mistake or anything like that, the first, my first admonition for you is that you need to change your mind. You need to repent. Some pain are engineered by, by bad choices, bad decisions. So repent if your pain is a result of poor decisions or action. I say if, if, if the pain is as a result of bad decision and accept that you made a bad decision so that you can turn things around. When David, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, committed all the atrocities that he committed, took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, impregnated her, and sent Uriah to the forefront of the war so that he could be killed and eliminated. David committed adultery, committed murder, and all that. When God would send Nathan, the prophet, to represent God and challenge David, the king of Israel. David did not say, I'm king, I'm this and that. The moment Nathan came and said, okay, and he just, because he didn't want to confront the king, he just told him in parables. A man had, you know, this number of animal, and then another, and then, and then he now took the one that belongs to. He was telling David, You have wives, you see two. David knew where he was going. After a while, David just said, I heard. Even the one you have not said. Because David now said, Ah, the man that did that decided to, he demand that kind of person should be killed, should be dealt with. In fact, I'll kill the person myself. And the prophet said, You are the one. You are the one. Yeah, you are the one. And David said, it's true. I knelt down, decided to beg and beg God. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. That's what he said. You shall not die. He said, however, the child that is coming out of this, the byproduct of this shenanigan, God is going to take it away. But you, God will preserve you. When we choose to repent, honestly admit our fault, our failures, our fears, and stop making poorer decisions out of desperation, then God starts to show up in our pain. That's if the pain you know has been inflicted because of bad decisions. Secondly, Or before I go to the second one. When the situation is like that, it's important that you do not remain in a situation where your pain persists or continues to increase. It's very important. You know, somebody can, uh, can be in an abusive relationship, for instance. You know you have aided the abuse, but the abuse is still there. When you change your mind, you repent. The next thing to do is also to look for how to safeguard your life. Yeah. God can use anything, including pain, to turn our lives around. But he will not allow us to be tempted more than that which you can bear. So when you are in a situation that can take your life, you don't say that God wants me there because he's doing something in my life. No, you separate yourself from that pain first. Yeah. Because we see many Christian women being killed today because of just staying in an abusive relationship, physical abuse, all kinds of abuse. Yeah. You can be under a different roof and God is still working. Yeah. And after a while, everything works together for the good of them that love God. And God can still reunite that family. But to stay in the place of abuse until you become a mental wreck, or you lose an organ in the body, or anything like that, that doesn't bring glory to God. The Bible says it will not allow you to be tempted more than that which you can bear. Also, seek necessary support. Yeah. Seek necessary support. Seek necessary support. I 
talking about moving from pain to power. You need to seek necessary support. How do I mean by necessary support? The, part of the reason why you should belong vitally to a church is that within your faith community, there are many things that God wants to be able to achieve in your life. I was dressing up coming for the first service earlier today. Um, in the very early hours of the morning, uh, 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 past 6 a.m. here, just a few minutes past 6 a.m., when I got a call from one of us here who told me, oh, PJ, I'm sorry for calling you too early. I said, no problem. He said, I just lost my mom. I empathized with him. For the next 10, 15 minutes, I was sharing with him. I'm praying with him. I'm telling him my own personal story of when I lost my mom and my journey of faith through that process and what that journey did to me and strengthened him. When you go through crisis, have you positioned yourself within the, you know, the ambit of God's grace where God can use people around you to touch your life. Many believers today will rather treat their church, treat their church like a restaurant than a family house. A restaurant is a place where you just eat and go. Eat, pay, and go. And if you're a bad person, you, you won't look for how not to pay. Just eat and look for the next door and just walk out. Yeah. Some people still do it. Yeah. But that's, the church is not a restaurant. Just a family. It's a spiritual family. Maybe on another day, I, I'm going to teach more about this. But there, there are different things that God wants to do in the different places where he's planting you. Let me give you an example. Some people are more committed, more involving, more resourceful, and being resourced, and they too resourcing within their professional community and network. That works for your career. But you can be enjoying that, and your faith is becoming stunted in the things of the Spirit. Because within your faith network, your you know, spiritual family, you are, for the want of a better word, unrecognized. A personal non grata. Unrecognized. Because you, you, you have not connected. When crisis come, in the life of the apostles, they went back to their own companies and they were surrounded by prayer and blessings. And they gain strength to go through the worst persecution ever. That's the format from the early church. The church of Jesus can only be effective if we continue to model such format. So today when we say, connect with your church, uh, join a small group, do this and do that, even people online. In this church, we have a pastor in charge of online. Some people say they are online, they are online. They are not connected with anything that's happening in your church. You just live stream when you can. No, if you, if you, if this is your real faith family, then connect fully. Online notwithstanding. There are ministers online. We have a pastor in charge of online church. There are online gatherings, online get together all around the world. We have online small groups. It was because of online small group that some of our members in Ukraine, when the war broke out, were able to get them out of Ukraine. The lady gave her testimony here. She didn't spend a dime to get back to Nigeria. It's the people on the, on the online community of this church that got her out of that place and sent her to different places until she got home here in Nigeria. Yeah. We've gotten calls from her family members. Pastor Bali had met her mom. I think her mom had even come, uh, you know, and all that to so just say thank you. And it's, it's, it's not even from the central place here. It's the online church and the online community, the small groups online. Your faith community is there to help you build your faith. Your career network is for career progression. Maybe I should add one more to it and I'll take my last point and stop. Some people also move away from their biological family. That's why you are not grounded. Because see, I'm the lead pastor of the Elevation Church. But I have an older brother. That if he calls me after this service, he can, he can tell me, God, man, you're stupid. Yeah. Your head is all correct. Because you did this, you did that. I say, ah, sorry, sir. I, I. It takes family. My wife can talk to me. My children can face me and say, Dad, no, that's not true. That's not correct. You're managing the truth there. 
You need to say it the way it is. Family is for you to be grounded. People who don't have family, they live in the sky. They live. They are floating. The robber is not meeting the road. The people who have permission to speak the truth to you in a, in a way that nobody can are the people connected with you by blood. Yeah. When you cut yourself off from everybody, you're just cutting yourself off from what should ground you. So I, I, I'm just giving you different examples of how uh, the necessary support that we need from time to time is uh, if we continue to cut off ourselves from God ordained networks. One is your church. You shouldn't. You should be connected to your church, be connected to family, biologically. My oldest brother that I spoke about gained the right under God to knock my head any day when he paid my university school fees. When I gave my life to Christ, my dad had no money to pay, but he was hungry. Yeah. My brother was the one that paid my way to university. Till tomorrow, if he calls me now, if he says jump, I'll jump. Yeah. And because if you don't jump, thunder will fire you. <laughs> That's just a joke, by the way. <laughs> I just wanted to rein it in more because some people take some things for granted. Yeah. God positions such things around us to make us grounded. So that notwithstanding how high you go in life, your head can still be calm when some people get in the game. That's why you need a pastor also. Some people say they don't need a pastor. You need a pastor to challenge your spiritual development, to challenge your spiritual growth, to speak comfort into your life when you go through situations. A pastor is like a shepherd. Yeah. Guides and strengthens. It's very necessary. So seek the necessary support. Pray for courage to act on time. And lastly today, share your experience with other people. Share your experience with other people. That's the only way you won't waste your pain. Share your experience with other people. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. Peter went through crisis. In Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. But when Jesus looked at him, he saw ahead of him as his own shepherd. And he said, Peter, verse 31 of Luke 22. The enemy has desired to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. He said, when you return back to me, King James says, when you are converted, he says, strengthen your brethren. When Jesus said, I prayed for you, that your faith will not fail. If you hear that Peter denied Jesus three times, your temptation is to feel like his faith actually failed. A failed faith is a faith that bends and breaks. Peter was bent, you know, in that process, but he didn't break because he still went back to Jesus. That's resilient faith. You bend it, it actually responded to pressure, but it didn't break. Yeah. Peter denied Jesus three times, but went back to Jesus. Jesus said, I've seen the trajectory. I'm praying for you. You will come back. Yeah. Your faith will be tried, but you will be back. Today, I'm calling people back home. Anyone who is far from God. You think that your faith has failed. You think you have messed up. You think God is angry with you, but God wants you back. Situations may have bent your back, but you can return back to shape as you return back to Jesus. Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. He said, but when you are back, strengthen your brethren. There are many situations, many circumstances littered all around this place that is wasting, that you can reach your office tomorrow and tell somebody about your testimony. Share what you have gone through. You hear that somebody is going through something. Volunteer yourself. I've been there. I want to talk to that person. Yeah, I've been there. I want to talk to that person. I want to speak to this person. I want to encourage this person. That's how we don't waste our pain. Many ministries, many great initiatives, NGOs, different things have started out of people. Yeah. A lady in this church started a, a school for special needs people because she had a special needs child herself. And her school is one of the best around today. But it was born out of an experience that she herself had gone through. All kinds of things that I've seen around here and around the world of people who are turning their pain to power. So that what the enemy meant for evil, God turns it around for your good. Because our God is always intentional. Somebody blessed today. I said somebody blessed today. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Glory be to God. Glory be to God. With all this bow, can I pray for someone? Someone who may be saying, Pastor, I know life has dealt all kind of blow to me. My faith, I can almost say, has literally crumbled. But I want to return back to Jesus. I want my faith to be strengthened. The journey of a stronger faith starts with coming back to fellowship with God. When your faith has been battered, when you don't know where you are again with God, it starts with, Father, forgive my sins. Cleanse me from every unrighteousness and hold me back in your hand. Can I pray for anyone here today who may be saying, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. I want to give my life to Jesus. Or somebody else who may be saying, I gave my life to Jesus before, but I backslid into sin. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I want to have a new beginning with God. I want to have a new beginning with God. I want to have a new beginning with God. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Wherever you are in this auditorium, can you lift your right hand above your head? And I'm going to say a prayer for you. I'm going to say a prayer for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anyone online joining this prayer, I want you to go to the chat or comment and write it there. I want to give my life to Christ or I want to rededicate my life to Christ. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I want to pray for you. If you are right in the room, can you lift your right hand above your head right now? Lift it above your head. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. If your hand is up, can you stand by your chair right there? Just stand by your chair right there if your hand is up. Please stand by your chair right there. And I'm going to pray for you. If your hand is up, stand by your chair right there. Stand by your chair right there. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. Just stand by your chair right there. Whether you are in front, you are at the back, wherever you are right now, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I ask that you stand by your chair. Just stand there right where you are. And God will reach you right where you are. And you will never be the same again. You'll never be the same again. You'll never be the same again. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. Thank you. I'm just waiting. Just 30 more seconds. Like maybe one or two people struggling to respond to God right now. I want you to just stand and respond to God. God is starting something new in your life. And you will never be the same again. Never be the same again. If you're standing, and if you're online joining this prayer, I want, to, I want to pray with you right now. I want you to, to just say this with me under your breath. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I ask that you forgive me my sins and that you cleanse me from every unrighteousness. I accept your sacrifice, your death on the cross as a payment for my sin. I receive your life into me as I accept you today as my Lord and my personal Savior. Fill my heart with your spirit and give me a new beginning with you from this moment forward. I declare that I'm now born again. I'm made righteous by Jesus Christ's sacrifice. I declare that I'm a child of God from this moment forward. I will live the rest of my life serving Jesus and loving him with my life. In Jesus' name.